गुरुवे गौर चंजय धारिकाय तदावे कृष्णाय कृष्ण भक्ताय ताद भक्ताय नमो नमः वंचकल्पत्रुभ्यश्च कृपा सिंधु भयेवच पातित नाम पावनेव्यो वैष्णवेव्यो नमो नमः जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो नित्यानंद श्री आद्वैत गदधार श्री वासारी गौर भक्तविंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे मैं धन्यवाद प्रणाम दी बोरी सो टुडे आई वॉन्ट टू मेक ए स्मॉल प्रेजेंटेशन एज इज मैं समय मेकिंग द केस that is been debated uh over the course of some years uh and is widely accepted i believe on one side but may be questioned by a smaller contingent on another side and that is that shri shukdev goswami who is speaking shrimad bhagavatam is the greater shuk lila shuk of shrimati radharani and krishna So first let me set the table of how the discussion has come about many many self realized rasik babu vaishnavas have declared a very um bold statement that shukadev goswami the speaker of shrimad bhagavatam is in fact the lila shuk means a play parrot of shrimati radharani and krishna and that upon the ending of their pastimes uh here in boma lila they requested that that shuk that parrot should stay behind and recite their glories in the form of shrimad bhagavatam in this world so <clears throat> in regards to the appearance of shukadev goswami uh, as the seminal son of vyas there are many narrations in skanda purana brahma vaivart purana shanti parava of mahabharat also nard puran so this is mutually accepted by all parties also many of the stories of the seminal appearance of Shukadev Goswami are mutually accepted. So it is only the question of the more esoteric idea of Shukadev Goswami's appearance as the parrot of Radha and Krishna is under discussion. So I won't go back and repeat all the Puranic stories. Again, I've given references for where they are. Uh, just in brief, there's the story of the asa day preparing for yagya and in preparing for yagya he saw one apsara named gritachi and having seen her beauty and charm he involuntarily had a similar mission and in the arani wood which was prepared for that yagya once the fire was produced shukte goshami manifested from there another story is that uh the asa day d married the daughter of jabali rishi Uh, her name was Vitika and he prayed to uh, Mahadev Shiv that he could have a son who would be self realized on the blessings of Mahadev the ass after impregnating Vitika then some 12 years later <laughs> a self realized son appeared who was Shukdev Goswami but of course he immediately left home and um, when the ass Dev went to speak to mahadev that you promised me a self realized son but that immediately upon appearing in this world he left without any connection to family or anything else so how will i uh, have the benefit of the benediction that you gave so that sukhdev goswami returns home because another part of the narrative is that vyasadev wanted to explain the shrimad bhagavatam to his own son he had his epiphany after the 
darshan of Sri Narada Muni Ji, and after hearing ten shlokas from Narada Muni, he did meditation, bhakti yogya namanasi, samyak pratihile amale, apasya purusham puranam, maya yam upasritam. And in his meditation, by the blessing and influence of his conversation with Narada Muni, apashat purusham puranam, he saw everything completely. I once inquired from my own Guru Padma, what is the meaning here? Because in many other Puranas, the pastimes of Radha and Krishna mentioned, Padma Puran, Brahma Vaivat Puran, others. So my Guru Padma told, but never had it been spoken in the context of the superiority of Radhika's praying. And therefore, what Vyasadeva saw in his dhyan, in his meditation, Maya Yamupasritam, how Krishna takes shelter of Yog Maya to fulfill his desire for the Ras Lila. And in that Ras Lila is a place in which the glory of Srimati Radhika's Maharanakya Mahabhav can be experienced by Krishna. Not him experiencing Maranakya Mahabhav, but his tasting that kind of frame coming from the Asraya Jatya, means the repository of that love, Srimati Radharani. So Vyasadeva wanted to explain Bhagavatam like this to his own son. So Shukadeva Goswami, he returns, of course, the various narratives are synthesized in Srimad Bhagavatam. In the Srimad Bhagavatam narrative, all of the other Puranic uh, stories have been synthesized in a narration in Srimad Bhagavatam. Srila Baladeva Vijabhushanji explains, though, that all of these different narratives happen in different kalpas or different days of Brahma. So in this particular day of Brahma that comes in the 28th Dibya Yuga, once in a day of Brahma, uh, when Krishna appears and then Mahaprabhu follows, that appearance of Shukadeva Goswami I'll discuss in a minute. But here he synthesized the other descriptions in other Puranas. So Vyasadeva does explain Srimad Bhagavatam after um, enticing Shukadeva Goswami to come back from the forest by reciting some say four verses, some say three verses. Two verses are universally accepted. And so these two verses certainly are the inspiration for Shukadeva Goswami returning to Vyas and hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, but then again leaving home to wander the world. But here, in one Puranic narrative, it's described that in order to satisfy Vyasadeva, a chaya sukh, means a shadow, expansion of Shukadeva Goswami, stays with Vyasadeva, becomes married, has children, everything. So you can see there's a complete uh, complex narrative of many forms of Shukadeva Goswami. So how is it concluded that the Shukadeva Goswami, who spoke Srimad Bhagavatam, is actually the Krita Shuk or Lila Shuk of Radha and Krishna? One other narrative given, and from very reliable source, I've heard this is described in Narada Puran, right? Now it could also be ex uh, explained in any Bhagavat Mahatma in Padma Puran as well, right? The other descriptions certainly are there in Skanda Puran, Brahma Vaivat Puran, etc. But this particular narrative explains that while Sri Mahadev once spoke Srimad Bhagavatam, to Parvati at her request. Mahadev, becoming very absorbed, closed his eyes and began narrating Srimad Bhagavatam. Parvati Didi, uh, Parvati Mata, excuse me, Parvati Mata, she, hearing the Bhagavatam at certain sections, her interest would wane and she began to sleep. While mm, Mm. Mahadev was reciting and in the parts where she was awake she would reciprocate because Mahadev had his eyes closed in absorption she would reciprocate by saying hmm, hmm, go on, go on hmm and in this way uh, Mahadev felt the mm, encouragement to go on describing and describing 
So when Parvati fell asleep, one parrot who had arrived there before the recitation of Bhagavatam by Mahadev, who was seated in a tree, uh, camouflaged, he was also hearing. And in hearing that Srimad Bhagavatam, when Parvati would fall asleep, he would, in the voice of Parvati, continue, hmm, hmm, go on, go on, hmm, hmm. And in this way, Mahadev, staying very encouraged, recited the whole Srimad Bhagavatam. Upon awakening, he found that Parvati uh, had not digested everything, and she honestly told, O oh, Prabhu, certainly at some parts of your narration, I began to sleep, so I did not hear everything. So then Mahadevji thought, well, if you did not hear, who was giving the continual encouragement and response? Hmm, hmm, go on, go on. So Mahadev began to look around in Kailas, near Ashram, and he spotted that parrot. So many narrations are given here that he took one piece of grass, turned it into like Brahmastra to strike that parrot. Most narratives say he took his trisul and began to chase that parrot. That parrot fled and went to Barakrikashram. There in Barakrikashram, while uh, the wife of Vyasadev, some say she was listening to Srimad Bhagavatam and doing one very mm, mm, rustic part of Srimad Bhagavatam in Chamatkar, means in amazement, she opened her mouth to go, whoa. And at that time, that parrot flew directly into the mouth of Bhitika. Some say also Bhitika, once he was yawning during that period, and that shook flew into the mouth and therefore into the womb of Bhitika. When Mahadev arrived there, he was extremely angry and the asked because it is the nature that if anyone will come to take shelter of you in any way, form or fashion to your home, then you're obliged to offer them protection. So the asked approached Mahadev and told, listen, this sukh has entered my ashram. Knowing your glories and your power, I know you can do anything. But I want to ask one question. You yourself have just given Amara Katar. Amara Katar means mm, that Katar by which hearing one becomes deathless, immortal. If you're saying that this parrot heard that Amara Kata, how is it possible for you to chastise him by killing? <laughs> so Lord Shiva immediately accepted this logic and he gave blessing to Vihas and he left that place. So our charges have described why would Mahadev have become angry in the first place that the parrot heard Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is of such a nature that whoever hears Bhagavatam, even if you recite Srimad Bhagavatam and trees and stones are present, then they also benefit because there's some Atma there. They also benefit from hearing. So why did Mahadev become angry? Another side is that one should hear Bhagavatam after having become surrendered to Sri Guru. Because who's speaking Bhagavatam is also Shravan Guru. If not directly Diksha, Shiksha Guru, etc., they are Shravan Guru, Bhagavat Shravan Guru. And there is an etiquette to be observed when in dealing with Guru. So one, Shuk being in a tree, posted himself in a higher position than his Shravan Guru, Sri Mahadev. Secondly, rather than coming and doing pranipat, means surrendering, he positioned himself in a hidden way. So by doing that, it indicated thievery. That one will come and hear Srimad Bhagavatam and then steal the jewels of Srimad Bhagavatam for any nefarious purpose. So Mahadev in this Leela is mm, demonstrating that such persons are really not hearers of Srimad Bhagavatam, but rather they are thieves of the jewels of Bhagavatam. And their further recitations of Bhagavatam will be unfruitful to the hearer. You understand? So to prove these points, to give this Upakyan teaching, Mahadev performed this Leela. But it's also explained by many Rasikacharyas, and for this I'm going to give some praman 
Um, that that Shuk, who was the parody, who heard that Srimad Bhagavatam, was actually the Leela Sukh of Radha and Krishna. And that Leela Sukh, having felt deep separation from Srimati Radhika and Krishna, came to hear Srimad Bhagavatam in order to be consoled from that separation. Okay? So that parrot was no ordinary parrot. That parrot was the Leela Sukh of Srimati Radharani. And that Leela Sukh was who's hearing. And this whole pastime is actually a Leela in order to manifest Srimad Bhagavatam. So we should also understand Srimad Bhagavatam is not a book. Srimad Bhagavatam, Turiya Bhagavata Krishna Vibhu Savasraya, Prati Shloke Prati Akshale Nanakarkai. It is the unlimited depth of all of the moods of Radha and Krishna. It is Turiya Bhagavata Krishna, directly Krishna himself. And in Padma Puran, it actually describes it is not just Krishna in a figurative or poetic way. But actually the first two cantos are the lotus feet. The next two cantos are like the thighs of the Lord. His navel is like the fifth canto. And on and on it describes his beautiful face. Face is the Dasamaskanda, or tenth canto of Bhagavatam. So in this way, Krishna's direct form is manifest to Srimad Bhagavatam as well as the form of Srimati Radharani and all of Vrindavan Dham and associates, etc. So no ordinary person can speak Srimad Bhagavatam. No ordinary sage, no person who was simply born <laughs> even to a great sage like Vyasadeva. Even though Vyasadeva is more than a sage, he is the Shakya Vesha Shri Bhagavan. He is Vedanta Krit. In Bhagavad Gita it's mentioned there. Hmm. What is this verse? Ha. Ah. Hmm. I'm thinking. Give me one second. Ah. Ah. Vedanta Vit. Vedanta Krit. Eva Chaham. That by all of the Vedas I am to be known. So there's three things that are mentioned here. The object of the knowledge of the Vedas, right? This is called Vishaya Jatya, it means Krishna. I am also the knower of all the Vedas. Here it indicates Asraya Jatya. Those who know Krishna and who knows Krishna best, Asraya Jatya Rup is Shimati Radharani and all devotees descending from that. They know Krishna. But then a third category is mentioned. Vedanta Krit Eva Chaham. Vedanta Krit means who compiled the Vedas. So that is the third category. And that third category, it is not mentioned in which category they have understood Srimad Bhagavatam. Have they understood from the perspective of being the mm, Shakya Vesh of Sri Krishna? Or have they understood being under the Anugatya of the Asraya Jatya? You understand? So a third category is mentioned. So Vyasadeva, though he's a very great sage, it is only later on that the clarity around whether Vyasadeva understood Bhagavatam or not is revealed. Because we have a very famous verse, it is quoted in Antilil of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Right? Aham Vedmi, Sukho Vedmi, Vyasavetina Vettiva. He's saying, I know the meaning of Srimad Bhagavatam. Sukadev Goswami knows the meaning of Srimad Bhagavatam. Whether we ask knows or not, I cannot say. So this is a very interesting thing, and it's part of what is pramaned for this point, that the Leela Sukha Radhika is Sukadev Goswami. How could it be that Mahadev could make the declaration, I know the meaning? Sukadev Goswami knows the meaning. Whether Vyasa knows or not, I cannot say. Vyasa Dev is the compiler. So based on what I just spoke, uh, Mahadev Ji is saying, I cannot ascertain from what angle of vision he's writing. Because prior to Narada Samvad, with mm, Vyasa Dev, he was acting under the auspices of being the empowered incarnation of Bhagavan to compile the Vedic scriptures to divide the, uh, one Vedu into four, 
to write all the um, uh, Purans and then also to write Mahabharat Itihas. Understand? So what his angle of vision was, what his realization was, right? He could not say. Even when Narada came to Bharatik Ashram, he observed a um, sort of void in Vyasadeva. And when he inquired about that, Vyasadeva revealed his mind to Nard Muni. And Nard Muni said, oh, the reason is because you've incurred in all of your writings further involvement in material life since gratification in the name of Dharma. You should, you have the empowerment of Bhagavan, therefore you're liberated soul. But you should concentrate on the sweet pastimes of Bhagavan. And from that, you should write. And this was the verse I quoted earlier, Bhakti Jogena Manasi, uh, Samyak Pratile Amale, etc. Understand? So after that absorption, Vyasadeva wrote Srimad Bhagavatam. So Mahadev Ji is saying, prior to that, we cannot tell whether he knows or not. But here comes the interesting point. If Mahadev could make this statement, how could it be that Chukadev Goswami, who's speaking Bhagavatam, was only dependent on having heard it from Vyas. Because Mahadev is saying, Suk already knows. I can attest to this. Whether Vyas knows or not, I cannot say. But how can you say the guru of the speaker <laughs> may or may not know, but the speaker affirmatively knows? How would that be possible? More evidence. And we're going to get to a discussion on what is Praman before I get to a move Praman. What is the evidence that Mahadev can lean into that I know definitively what is Bhagavatam? Sukha knows definitively what is Bhagavatam. Because the conclusion of Bhagavatam is that one realizes Radha and Krishna's Leela. So Sukha so, Sukadeva Goswami has that realization intrinsically because he is the Leela Sukha of Radha and Krishna. Mahadev has that intrinsic realization because in the original form of Mahadev is Sada Shiv. That Sada Shiv, Shiv performs the Leela to become Gopishwa Mahadev. So, from the perspective of Gopishwa Mahadev or the Leela Sukha of Radha and Krishna, he definitively knows the meaning of Srimad Bhagavatam. You understand? So this is also Praman that that Sukhdev Goswami speaking is the Leela Sukh of Radha and Krishna. Understand? Another thing, there are ten different types of Praman. Jiva Goswami has accepted that three types of prominent. Shabda means what is written in Sastra. Anuman, inference, because Sometimes something may not directly be spoken in Sastra, but by inference, it supports the idea that it is in Sastra. You understand? I'm going to give a demonstration of that upcoming. Third is Pratyaksha. Pratyaksha means direct experience. Then there's, there's other things like Upaman, Artapati, Sambhav, Abhav. Uh, Arsha, which is very important, it means the sayings of the Rishis. So, Jeep Goswami Pad has mentioned that the seven other Pramans, they are somehow present in the first three. Shabda, <clears throat> Anuman, and Pratyaksha. So, when we look at these three prominent kinds of Pramans, do they give any support to the idea that the Leela Shukha Radha and Krishna is Shukdev Goswami. So first and foremost, the Mu Praman for everything is Srimad Bhagavatam. In the line of Mahaprabhu, this is prominent. Sri Vishnu Chakravati Thakurapad is mentioning Arajyo Bhagavan Vrajesha Tanayas Tad Dhamma Vrindavanam Ramyaskaschit Upasana Vrajavadu Varagena Yakalpita Srimad Bhagavatam Amalam Pramanam that the Amal Praman, the spotless evidence for everything, is Srimad Bhagavatam. And we also accept that all knowledge, therefore, not like Srimad Bhagavatam is separate from Ved, separate from Itihas. 
because it's mentioned artam brahma sutra nam but artha avinenaya gayatri bhashya rupa so devata paribrahmita all explanations of all shastra is present in shrimad bhagavatam so it is the mool praman especially in our line coming from mahaprabhu uh, we accept this is mool praman and spotless praman so the first question will be therefore mukunda is there any praman in shrimad bhagavatam for shukdev goswami being the leela shuk of radha krishna so we should see that in shrimad bhagavatam it is mentioned Sri Sukha Uvacha. Sri Sukha Uvacha. What is this Praman then, Mukunda? Sri, many of our Acharyas have translated. Sri means Sriya, Sriya Sukha Uvacha. Sriya Sukha Uvacha. That the Sukh of Sri, meaning Radhika, Uvacha is speaking. So now the Purva Paksh or the opposing argument can come, but this word Shri has many meanings. Shri means beauty. Shri means a kind of opulence. Shri means Lakshmi Devi. But all of those meanings, when they are culminated together, find their prasanna in Shrimati Radhika. Therefore, the cumulative or ultimate meaning of the word Shri is Radha, because there's no quality of Shri. Which can be separated from Radha. You understand? The sum total of all Lakshmi's is Radha Rani. The sum total of all beauty is Radha Rani. The sum total of all opulence is Radha Rani. <laughs> Therefore, there is no denying that the word Shri certainly can mean Radha, and we don't have any compelling reason written in any commentary of Acharyas. That say this word does not mean Radhika. You should not take it like that. So they will give the argument. Well, because it can be used as an honorific title for others, and it is so in Bhagavatam, then it does not mean necessarily that it's Radha. But if you look carefully, when it describes the beginning of the speaking of Sutta Goswami to the sages at Namasaranya. It does not say Sri Sutuvacha, though it would be equally applicable, because it's not only directly Sri's Suk, but those who are connected to Radhika can also be addressed with the title Sri, Sri Guru, because he's connected to Radha. You understand? So anyone connected to Radha in a significant way may be honored with the title Sri. So, but it doesn't say it when it comes to saying "sutta uvacha." It simply says "sutta uvacha," and in many other cases, anyone speaking will simply "this person uvacha." Now, certainly there are some places where Sri is applied, and we have to look at the context of that. Is it someone being honored by a junior and therefore being given the honorific title? Because, again, other things are included in that meaning. You understand? But we have no compelling reason given by Acharyas. But more, we have the reasoning given by realized Acharyas, and this brings me to another kind of praman, pratyaksha. So pratyaksha means direct perception. Direct perception in conditioned souls and realized souls are not the same, because conditioned souls. Are infested with four kinds of defects, then their direct perception is subject to those four defects, and therefore their pratyaksha doesn't hold weight unless it is completely matched with shabda, right? It doesn't hold evidentiary weight in the same way as the、mm, realizations or pratyaksha of a realized Siddha Mahapurush. Siddha Mahapurush is absent of these four kinds of defects. Their vision is exclusively permeated by love. Premanjane chirak of premanj premanjana chudita bhakti vilo chanena. Their pratyaksh is based in premanjan, 
of their vision. So it is not infused with any kind of defect. Therefore, among the ten types of Praman, Asha, the sayings of realized Rishis is given weight. So we have many, many statements of Siddha Mahapurushas who declare that Shukadev Goswami is the Leela Sukh of Radhika by Guru Parapadma being one of them. You understand? So now, two types of Praman have been given. Also, the third command of inference is given in the narrative of the parrot who heard the Srimad Bhagavatam from a Mahadev and flew into the mouth of Bhitika and was born as Sukhdev Goswami. Another thing that is brought up is how could it be that the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam is Brahmavadi? Because it's mentioned, and some of the Purva some of the opposing arguments to this, is that Shakti Goswami was Brahmavadi. And it was only after hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, beginning with those four, three, or two verses I mentioned, that his Brahmavad was broken. So here we have to make a deep inquiry. Is there anywhere written in all Sastra? that Shukdev Goswami spoke Brahmavad philosophy. Anywhere. That he spoke Brahmavad philosophy. Then why our Acharyas have spoken that he was in Brahmavad? So listen carefully. There's actually a verse in Srimad Bhagavatam which describes the Nirvikalp Samadhi of hmm, Shukdev Goswami. What is Nirvikalp Samadhi? According to the Yoga Sutras of Pantanjali, Nirvikalp Samadhi is that Samadhi in which all Chitta Vrittis, means functions of the Chitta, have been insulated inside and have no external stimuli. You understand? There's Salvikalp Samadhi and Nirvikalp Samadhi. So Nirvikalp Samadhi means when the Chitta Vrittis do not accommodate any sensory perception from the outside. And therefore one's internal meditation, absorption, etc. has no resonance of external influence. Whereas in Salvikalp uh, Samadhi, there's possibility that the sensory perceptions are not completely shut off, but one still in their concentration meditation may go on. But their sensory mm, experience of the environment is not gone. So, because this was present in Sri Shukdev Goswami in the Leela of his appearance, our Acharyas have given credence to that. Now, what does Brahmavad mean here? Brahmavad means when the Chitta Vrittis have completely shut off from any external sensory influence but are not mm, stimulated by the mm, sabgun form of Brahman, meaning the nature of personal realization of Sri Krishna, his Dham, his associates, Prem, etc. Mm, two states of existence can be there. One is called Atma Ananda, realization of the nature of the Atma, and Brahmananda, realization of the energy of Bhagavan void of the specificity of his personality, etc., etc. So because Chukdev Goswami, by his Leela, entered the world under the auspices that Krishna, because one other part of the narrative is that when Chukdev Goswami was in the womb of Bhittika, he stayed there, some say 12, and many Acharya say 16 years. When Vyasa Dev, hmm, Asked why you will not come out, right? He told, I don't want to be in a Lushri Maya. So I will only come out if this Maya can be removed. Who can remove Maya? Only Sri Krishna Bhagavan can remove Maya? Or those deputed by Krishna can remove Maya? So Vyasa Dev, some say directly prayed, I mean, excuse me, some say he prayed, and some say he went directly to Dwarka and bought Sri Krishna Bhagavan there. 
Sri Krishna, now this is another thing. Sri Krishna will personally come for the appearance just of any ordinary seminal personality. Right? No, there's something special about this. He bought that Sri Krishna came there and spoke to Shukdev Goswami, oh, you should not trouble your mother. You should come out from the womb. So Shukdev Goswami, I will not come out unless Maya is removed. Krishna says, I will remove this Maya for one second only. And in that one second, Shukdev Goswami made his appearance. So there's a very deep upakin here. What is that teaching? Simply the removal of Maya does not equate to realization of Bhagavat Prem. To teach this lesson for all of those various Rishi, Sadhus, and other kinds of Mahatmas who pursue the path of Gyan or Yoga in what the primary function is the removal of ignorance, removal of Maya, removal of Avidya. They will realize Atma Anana Brahmanan. But you cannot realize Krishna without the Anugatya of the devotees of Krishna. Do you understand? To prove this point, even before speaking Srimad Bhagavatam, Sri Shukdev Goswami demonstrates this Leela. And by doing so, he also demonstrates the superiority. He demonstrates the superiority of Prem Seva Ananda. He also demonstrates that for a liberated soul, hmm, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam is more blissful than Brahmananda. By only hearing three or two verses uh, of Srimad Bhagavatam, his quote, Brahmananda, was broken. And he immediately returned to Vyasadeva and heard the entire narration of the next of Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, it could also be understood that if that Sukh who heard Bhagavatam from Mahadev is the same Sukh that manifested from the womb of Bhitika, didn't he already know Srimad Bhagavatam? Therefore, as soon as Vyasadev started to narrate Srimad Bhagavatam, or even he heard those verses while still being away from Vyasadev, it immediately nourished or immediately manifested the samskars of Bhagavatam heard from Mahadev. More than that, because his eternal identity is the Lila Sukha Radhika, simply by hearing one glory, one aksha of the glory, means one letter of the glories of his worshipful objectives, immediately any kind of Brahmavad was broken. You understand? So now, what have our charyas said about this? Is there any further evidence from Acharyas regarding this point? So in our Mool Granth, the very first Granth of the Goswamis which was written was Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. So I want to describe from Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, this is going to be in the mm, first canto, chapter 7, and this is verses 156 starting and going to 158. A description of the nature of the internal mood of Shukdev Goswami. And before I do that, I want to give some other praman by inference. When Shukdev Goswami wandered again away from home and wandered to the bank of the Ganga, knowing that he would have the chance meeting with Maharaj Parikshit, who was saved in the womb by Krishna himself. So Krishna saved from the Brahmastra, Parikshit Maharaj in the womb of Uttara. So now, when for the meal of the manifestation of Srimad Bhagavatam to be spoken, he will not send an arrangement for that. So he simultaneously sends an arrangement that will save the life of Maharaj Parikshit again and reveal the means by which everyone's life can be saved, which is the hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam. So Shukdev Goswami wanders to the bank of the Ganga Samte Jamuna, and there he uh, comes into the assembly of thousands and thousands of rishi, rishis and sadhus who are trying to find what course of action, what modality should be taken at the time when Maharaj Parikshit has been threatened to be bitten by Takshak due to the sap or curse of Sringi. So at that time, 
all of the rishis recognize, but especially Narada Muni's present and Vyasadeva present, among many other senior rishis, they elect that Sukhdev Goswami should sit on the asan and speak Srimad Bhagavatam. So what is the inference I'm speaking of here? When Udavji was coming from Prabhat after the disappearance Leela of Sri Krishna and he met Vidura and Vidura began to inquire from him about what was spoken by Krishna to him at that time. Udavji brings up after a brief discussion Maitreya Rishi was also present there. We know that Maitreya Rishi is not equivalent to Udavji. But Uddhava still told Vidura, you can hear these things also for Maitreya. So, Maryara Vyatikrama, the violation of etiquette will not take place. How could it be Shukdev Goswami has been selected to sit on the Vyasasan and he accepts it in the face of his Guru and Param Guru? How it can be? Because it is inferred by this, by both Nard and Vyas, that the quality of Sukhdev Goswami is different from their own. <laughs> Narda Muni has Swarup and Braj as Madhu Mangal and Nadia Gopi. But he's deferring as Param Gurudev in the Leela here, because he was the Shravan Guru to Vyasadev, and Vyasadev is Shravan Guru to Sukhdev Goswami. But they both deferred, and Shukdev Goswami himself did not feel an inadequacy of sitting on the Vyasasan because he was deputed by the ultimate authority of Radha and Krishna themselves who told him to stay in this world to manifest Bhagavatam. So Nard Muni, the Aas, who are the Guru and Param Guru of Shukdev Goswami, they understood this. They understood this. So this is Anuman, this is inferred Praman, why Shukdev Goswami is the Leela Sukh, the parrot of Radha and Krishna. Because they allowed, he'll sit on the Vyasasan. Other than that, would it not be Maryara Vyatikrama, violation of etiquette, to sit on the Asan in front of your own Guru and Param Guru. So more inferred. But what was the quality of Shukdev Goswami? What was his quality? So here again in Brihad Bhagavatamrita of Sri Sanatana Goswami Pad, he's mentioning verse 156. Gopina Mahima Kaskit Tasam Eko Api Shakyate Namaya Swa Muke Ekaratum Mehur Mashikaya Yata. So he says, I, I cannot, Gopina Mahima Kaskit. To describe the Mahima of gopis, I'm, I'm incapable. <laughs> I cannot even do this. Who's speaking here? This is Maharaj Parikshit speaking to Uttara hmm? because she wanted to know what it was that was spoken by Shukdev Goswami that he heard. She wanted to have a recap. So he's telling what <laughs> my Guru Parapadma, my Shravan Guru spoke. Uh, it is incapable for me to speak that Mahima of gopis in the same way. Right? I cannot describe with my own words uh, even one of the glories of the gopis. Any more than a mosquito can swallow Mount Meru. What's an example he's giving? <laughs> What's an example he's giving? Then he says, hmm? Aho. In Sanskrit, the, the word Aho, it is an exclamation of Chamatkar. Samatka means amazement, astonishment. It means the rising of a particular bhav that causes amazement in the heart. So he says, Aho, hmm? Krishna rasa vishta shada namni akritya. Krishna shata priyanam cha vibhashmi adinam guru mama. He says, but mama guru means my guru. But my spiritual master, my guru, is fully absorbed in the loving moods of serving Krishna. How is he absorbed? 
because he is the Leela Shoka of Radha and Krishna. In the Ananda Vrindavan Champu and also in Gopal Champu, it described that Srimati Radha, she would play with this sukh, this parrot. She would take pomegranate seeds and she would feed, or sometimes sweet rice, deer, and feed this parrot. And then she would teach the parrot, you should recite Krishna, Krishna. So all the moods of the recitation of the name of Krishna that's in the heart of Radhika was imbued in this parrot. And she's saying, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. But there's one feature of constantly saying the name of Krishna, name of Krishna. Because, Purnasuro, Nitya Mukto, Abhinatom, Nama Namyo. The name and the person are not different for a person who has the ability to realize that. So realizing that in his heart, that sukh became very enchanted. I have to go and have darshan of Krishna. So that sukh flew from Varsana and went to Nandagan. And there in Nandagan, he perched on one platform and Madhu Mangal and Krishna were sitting and they were about to take their lunch. That parrot, in the same voice tone as Srimati Radharani, began saying, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. So Krishna was very amazed. He began to look here and there. He looked at Madhu Mangal and almost wanted to embrace Madhu Mangal. What good fortune do I have? Could it be that my most beloved has made their appearance amazingly here? Because normally the Abhisadamis, the transportation to a meeting place with Krishna by Radhika is very complex arrangement. So to simply have appeared, especially in the daytime, in Nandagan, and to call out openly the name would be very unlikely. But Madhu Mughal told to Krishna, Oh, Saka, listen, this is a very good omen. This is a very good omen. It means that your Swamini is thinking of you. It means by destiny your meeting will take place. But it is not your Swamini. Look here. Madhu Mahu points and they look at the parrot. So then Krishna put his hand out and that sukh came and landed in the hand of Krishna. Then Krishna began to say, as the parrot kept reciting, Krishna, Krishna, then Krishna said, Radha, Radha. All of the moods of loving praying Krishna has to Radha were then absorbed in the ear of that sukh. So that sukh now was completely absorbed in, oh, what have I done? I've left Srimati Radharani to come here. But my heart is breaking because my real mm, mood of relation is to be the uh, servant of that Radharani. Just at that time, Lalit and Visakha showed up in Nandagan. Having followed the path of that Sukh, they came there and they saw Krishna and they thought, oh, here you are. And they told Krishna, this is the Sukh of my Swamini. So here we have mm, evidence also in Ananda Vrindavan Champu and also Gopal Champu. Also you may find written in mm, mm, Bhavana Sara Sangraha, which is a compilation by Siddha Krishna Das of many of the writings of um, like Vishnu Chakravati Thakur's uh, Krishna Bhavana Amrita, uh, Shri Krishna Kaviraj's Govinda Lila Amrita, Krishnaika Kamudi. So you'll find a compilation of all of those describing the Nitya Lila of Krishna. So then mm, Krishna said, if this is truly your parrot or the parrot of your Swamini and you've come in representation of her, then naturally the parrot should want to come back to you. So even though Sukh wanted to fly away, one issue is there. Anyone who comes in contact with Krishna is very difficult to break that contact. <laughs> so Sukh was finding it very difficult to leave Krishna also. So Vishaka and Lalita said, what trick you're playing we don't know, but you should voluntarily bring that Sukh and give to us. So Krishna says, no, no, no. You cannot come and simply claim something and simply on your word I have to accept it. Don't you know that I am Satyabrat? I've never told a lie ever. Krishna always puts himself in some position of extraordinary um, opposite of what he really does. <laughs> He's always telling lies. You understand? 
But in Tattvagata Vichar, Krishna's lie is the truth. But in Rasa Siddhant, Krishna is always lying. But he passed it, oh, I'm Brahmachari. Oh, I'm Satyavrat. I never tell lies. So here, he's saying, I never tell a lie. This parrot is free to roam in all this brood. It doesn't belong to anyone. But it has come to me, and therefore I am the owner. So, Lalita and Visakha, they go to Maya Shoda. Hey, Maya Shoda, no, your son has stolen the parrot of our Swamini. So, Mother Shoda came there, looking at Krishna. She said, oh, naughty boy, give me this parrot. <laughs> and she took Krishna by the ear and told Mother Mughal, come. Your father has been waiting to take prasad, and you're sitting here, and you're playing with any birds in the forest. So she took that parrot, gave it back to Vishakha and Lalita, and by force of ear, took Krishna to take prasad with Nanda Baba. You understand? So, here Parikshit Maharaj is describing the qualities of that Shukdev Goswami, who is that parrot. A whole, in exclamation of amazement, Krishna Rasavishta, he's Krishna Rasavishta. He's fully absorbed in the pastimes of Krishna. And his, his absorption there is so thick because he has formed there. Nobody can be absorbed based on simply hearing philosophy. You cannot be absorbed simply by having remembered hmm, narration of Sastra. It's explained. Nayam Atma Pravachanena Na Merasaya Na Bhushutena Right? You cannot understand the nature of Krishna, Krishna Swarup, only by expertise or in erudition of giving lecture or having great intelligence, or even having studied so many sastra. Hmm? Eva Isha, Vrinute, Tena Labhya, Tasha Eva Isha, Vrinute, Tanuswam. Krishna will only reveal himself to those whom he wants to. Naham Prakasha Savasa, Yog Maya Samamrita. Krishna reserves the right to not reveal himself, to stay covered by his Yog Maya Shakti. Only Krishna is obliged to reveal himself. When the bhakti shakti becomes manifest, then Krishna is obliged. He cannot hide himself. <laughs> you understand? So he says, oh, Krishna Rasavishta. My Guru Dev is completely absorbed in tasting Krishna Rasa. There's no ras without rasmai radhika. There is no ras that Krishna could taste. So by saying this, he's saying, yes, he's absorbed in the Leela, in which Krishna tastes Ras with Srimati Radhika. Sadam Namni Krityat. He can constantly glorify Krishna. Right? Sadam Namni Krityat. Krishnasya Ta Priyanamacha. He can constantly uh, glorify Krishna, not only Krishna, but all the residents of Braj. He can glorify, but at some point is coming here. Krishna Shatta Priyanamcha. Also, the all dear devotees of Krishna, he can glorify. Hmm? Bashmai Adinam Guru Mama. My Guru, he can glorify very easily. Even he can glorify uh, Krishna's beloveds like Rukmani. Satya Bhama and others. But it's explained in the next verse. Mm. Gopinam Vita Buddha Sputahara Prema Nalistrichis Chato. The gopis were consumed by the expansive flames of wondrous thing of wondrous blazing fire of love for Krishna. This is called when the nature of praying reaches its height, it is called Mahabhav. Mahabhav has two different divisions, Rud and Adirud. They are distinguished by the nature of the intensity of the Asta Sattvic Vikar. Means like fainting, uh, change of body colors, voice, uh, your voice faltering, uh, hair standing on end, profuse crying. These kinds of sattvic bhav, when they come mm, all at one time, 
and they come in a condition which is called mm, sudipta. It is called blazing. You understand? So he's making this reference here. The wondrous blazing fire of love for Krishna. If my guru, hmm? then he says, Dutta bandhanam kila nama kirtan kritat tasam visheshat mutihi. If, however, he will chant the name, hmm. if my guru chants the names of these gopis and recalls the gopis' distinguishing qualities, he too is touched by the spark shooting forth from those flames of the intense fire, and he at once becomes greatly agitated. Therefore, he has to avoid pronouncing the gopi's name. So here, the gopi's name becomes singular. Why is that? Radha nama prachane na murchita san masiko So the verse is saying, and this is very powerful. There's one feature of praying, it is called Yabhat Asraya Vritti Asana Janata Ritvalodhanam. In Mahabhav, one feature, even in Ruz Mahabhav, is that the nature, even in Anurag, this is described. Anurag, Sam Samveja Dasha, Prapya Prakashita, Yabhat Asraya Vritti Shchet. One feature of this high class of love is that the love has the power to spill out of its container. And Yavat means whomever, Asraya, is nearby according to their quality, take shelter in them. And Asana Janata Rit Valodhanam, and churn their hearts with those same moods. So here he's saying, if my Gurudev will pronounce the name of that gopi who has this Sudipta Mahabhav in Mohan, means the Maranatya Mahabhav is the highest kind of manifestation of Prem and Radhika. Preceding that Maranatya Mahabhav is Modan, it means when Radha and Krishna are meeting, and Mohan, when they become separated. The nature of this Sudipta Mahabhav becomes especially manifest in Srimati Radhika upon the separation from Krishna and produces many, many wonderful things. It's described in Ujjali Mani Granta of Rupa Goswami. Ruda Akya Abhava Jato Yam Shamboga Vipralambika. Her separation from Krishna becomes so powerful, it produces meeting with Krishna. You understand? Her separation, the love imbued in that separation is so powerful, it manifests Krishna Himself. So there's many nuances to this, but I will get off track if I try to go into explaining those things. But here, my point was. Inference and Praman, and here this was the Shabda Praman, that the Leela Sukh of mm, Radha and Krishna is in fact Shukdev Goswami. So Maharaj Pariksit is describing my Shravan Guru is this person. And who is that? Oh, he's first of all, he's Krishna Rasavishta. He's also the recipient of the mood in the heart of. Mm, Srimati Radhika, the topmost gopi. So now let me bring one other praman for this before I get to an inferred praman. So bear with me. Bear with me. So bear with me one second. I just want to pull something up. How? Okay, all right. Ha. Ah. In the Venu Gita, which is the 21st chapter of mm, the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, there the gopis are in Purvarag. Purvarag means that mood of separation which has come when they're entering into their blossoming age as teenagers and their love for Krishna is being established. But, mm, mm, they have not quite met with Krishna in a conjugal way yet. You understand? So this is called Puravarag. You understand? In that Puravarag, their mood of love is very high. And in verse number 3 it mentions, when Krishna goes out to take the cows for grazing, 
He comes and sometimes he stops and he plays his flute. So this is a narration actually about many things, but one being the udipan or stimulus that comes when the young gopis in Purvaraj hear the flute of Krishna and what happens to them in the internal bhav they have, their mood. So tad rajastriya asrutya venu gitam smaro udayam kastit paroksham krishnasya svasakebhyo anuhanayam when the gopis heard Krishna play his flute, then immediately, because there's many, many millions of gopis, but each of the gopis has their own group, which they have allegiance to and friendship with. So there are essentially four different categories or groups of gopis. Based around the chief gopi, Shimati Radhika, her own near and dear friends are called Swapaksh, her own group. Then there's those like Shamla Saki who are very friendly to Radhika. And they are called Surit Paksh. There are those who are not against Radhika, but they have more inclination towards Chandravali, the chief rival Saki. And like Bhadra, they are called Tathashta Paksh. It means they're kind of neutral to Radhika, but have more friendship towards Chandravali. Then like Padma and Saibya, they are the Swapaksh or good friends with Chandravali's group, but they are Vipaksh, means the opposite party to Radhika and her group. You understand? So all these different gopis, when they heard the flute, swa sake byo anuvanayam, they ran and they joined their own hmm, particular group. Tatvani Atum, in their group, Arabda, they began after hearing this flute, smarantaya krishna chastitam. They began to remember immediately so many charming leelas of Krishna. And when they began to remember them, they wanted to speak one to another about them in their own personal group. But what happened? Nasakam smaravegena. Vikshipta manaso nepa. Vikship means like distraction. They became distracted. And nasakam smaravegena. The upsurge of smaraveg, smaraveg means the intensity of their love and their desire to be with Krishna, became so overwhelming, their minds became distracted and they could not speak. So this is in verse 4, they could not speak. Verse number 5, a beautiful appearance of Krishna had come in their heart and because that appearance of uh, Mm -hmm. uh, because that appearance had come into their heart, they could not give expression. They couldn't speak. They were stunned. So many astasattva vikar were coming. They could not speak. And therefore, it's mentioned mm -hmm. what appeared in their heart. Parahapitam natu varvapu kada kanyo karikaram bribat vasa kanaka kapistam vajantim chamalam. Randram Venu Atara Sudayo Puran Gopa Vrindai Vrindavanaranyam Swapada Ramana Pravisat Gita Kirti. They saw directly the form of Krishna. Parahapitam Natu Vara Vapu Kada. They what Vapu they saw? What form they saw? Parahapitam Natu Vara. Krishna as the greatest of all dancers. This is from a previous impression. During the Kaliya Damana Lila. When Krishna chastised Kaliya, when the young gopis had come there, they had previously always thought of Krishna only as their village associate, their friend in the village. <laughs> A very naughty boy, son of Mother Yashoda. He has so much pride because his father's a king, because they have nine lakhs cows. He was always with his band of uh, dikoid friends, stealing here and there. So this is what they understood. But when they saw Krishna, when he was dancing on the heads of Kaliya, the seed of their budding youth came and they saw Krishna as the most beautiful dancer and coveted the desire, someday I also want to dance with this boy. So now that very form of Krishna, decorated so beautifully, appeared in their heart, causing them to be unable to speak. Causing them to be unable to speak. What happened at that time? 
Iti venu ravan rajam. They are not speaking here. Iti venu ravan rajam. Sava bhuta manoharam. Shrupa vrajastriyo sarva. Vani anto adire dire. Someone is now describing what's going on in their hearts. Who is describing? Who is speaking Srimad Bhagavatam? Shukdev Goswami is speaking these verses in Srimad Bhagavatam based on having been in the position in which to witness this, for one, and two, to be accommodating, to imbibe the mood of the gopis in such a way he could speak even when the gopis could not speak. So he's saying, Iti venu ravan rajan sava bhuta manoharam. That when Krishna blows his flute, please, these gopis, they're expressing also avahit bhav, means they're expressing a mood of concealing their feelings. So he's saying here, don't blame that these gopis will be implicated. Because remember, they're still young girls. They're implicated in anything wrong. When Krishna plays his flute, sava bhuta manoharam, everyone becomes bewildered. And the whole rest of Venu Geet will prove how so many different categories of persons and even things become bewildered by hearing the flute of Krishna. So this is an Avahita Bhav. You understand? But who's speaking is what I'm making the point. Right? That Shukdev Goswami is witnessing and now he's speaking as Shukdev, Shukdev, I'm sorry, the Lila Shuk of Radhika and Krishna is experiencing and he's speaking now as Shukdev Goswami. Because only a person who has that experience can speak these things, even when the gopis themselves are not speaking. Now, what is the proof, Mukunda, that you are saying this? What is the proof? If you look at the commentary of Vishnu Chakravati Thakur, he directly says, gopis cannot speak anymore. So when do the gopis start speaking again? In the seventh verse it begins, Gopya Uchu. Now the gopis again begin to speak. What do they speak? Akshamvatam palamida parama vidmaha satya pasun anuvesata yo vyasavihi vaktram vajesa sutta yo anuvenu anuvenu justam yavanapitam anurakta kataksha moksham. So they start speaking again in this shlok. So it means what is the quality of Shukta Goswami? That his heart again is. Krishna, Rasha, Vishta. <laughs> he is fully absorbed. Therefore, Vyas, not all gave preference, he should speak. Because he is the Lila Sukh of Srimati Radharani. Last mm, Praman. Our Srila Vishnu Chakravati Thakurapad has written in his commentary, Sartha Darshani Tika, and I didn't even go, and I just think it will elongate this too much, to go into, in the Ras Panchit Jai, in the first verse describing Ras Lila, Bhagavani Pita, Ratri, Sarat, Utkali, Kamalika, etc. It begins, Sri Bhadraraini Vacha or Sri Shukru Vacha. If you look at the commentaries of our Acharyas describing Sri Sukh or Sri Bhadraraini Vacha, you will see how they glorify the nature of Shukdev Goswami. But here I'm taking from the third verse, the Faustuti verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, Nigama Kapatura Galitam Kulam, Sukumukhar Amrita Dravi Samnitam, Pibatu Bhagavatam Rasayam Alayam, Muhuraho Rasika Bhuvi Bhavuka. So Shukta Goswami has given one blessing. Vyasadeva also, Sutta Goswami also the same, Ashivaj or Faustuti verses applicable in all three cases of the speaking of Bhagavatam. What is that mm, blessing? That if any very fortunate person mm, mm, by great sukriti or by great mercy Brahmanya Brahmati Kon Bhagavanji Guru Krishna Prasadi Pori Bhakti Latavij right? By great creeper of Bhagavan and the Sadhu they are wandering throughout this universe you should know that I'm giving my blessing. Muhur aho. Again, this word aho comes here. Aho meaning in astonishment. After giving the invocation verse, it is called the Namaskaratmaka verse. And then the Vastu Nidesh Atmaka verse means the definition verse. Dharma Protita Kaitavotra. 
Now he's saying, what is the amazing thing about this entire Bhagavatam? That any very fortunate person can experience Rasik Babu Vaishnav Bhuvi means walking this earth. And if by great fortune, yet richa means great fortune, you avail to meet one. Then all oh, the fortune of hearing this Srimad Bhagavatam and the conclusions of the Srimad Bhagavatam will become available to you. So in describing that, he then describes the nature of the statement about Shukdev Gosami. So, Sukhumakad Amrita Dravi Samyutam. He's describing this section. And he says, hmm, Thus it is completely full of sweetness. He's describing the nature of Bhagavatam. Even after falling from a high position in the tree, it does not break. Right? Nor does it lose its sweetness. That is because it comes down from the highest position, which is Bhagavan himself, down through Parampara. Hmm? To Brahma, then to Nard, then to Vyas, because he's tracing out the speaking of Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is present in the Omkar. Bhagavatam is manifest in the heart of Brahma. Tinne Brahma Rita Adikavaye. Right? One Adikavi is Brahma. I'm going to bring up another Praman for that. Right? Regarding Shukdev Goswami. Then to Vyas, and then it emerges from the mouth of Shukdev Goswami. Thus, without being damaged, it is endowed with liquid sweetness. So he's giving the idea that when a mango becomes very ripe, normally, and I had this experience, I was preaching in Africa for many years, we were preaching in Zambia, we had both avocado and mango trees in the compound we were in. And during the ripe season for mangoes, they just fall from the tree, just unlimitedly falling. And they would break sometime hitting the ground. We would collect them and give them to one uh, lady who would then make mango rust out of them. Mango rot is when they squeeze the mangoes of all the juice and they freeze it, and then later on it comes out like a smoothie or whatever uh, as mango rot. Right? They mix it with a little cumin; it's very tasty. But it's saying here, this mango, which is the mature fruit of all Vedic Shastra, doesn't fall like that. It's carefully handed down. But what has made it sweet? Hmm. Hmm. Sukumukad amrit. The nectar, the highest form of concentration of its sweetness, Amrit, is there because Sri Sukh has bitten it and pierced it. Right? He's bitten and pierced this very sweet fruit. Right? Then it says, mm. Thus, without being damaged, is endowed with the li liquid sweetness like honey. Here, this liquid sweetness means rasa. That's what they're describing that all the rasa of Srimad Bhagavatam is fully present. And originally, if you think, if you really examine this verse, it gives the parampara as Brahma, to Nar, to Vyas, then to Sukh. But here, Sukh means, Sukhadeva is he's manifested in the Leela to speak Bhagavatam. But where is the origin of manifesting the sweetness of Bhagavatam? It says the Sukh, the parrot, bit the fruit. Therefore, originally, that Sukadeva Goswami, who has bit and tasted the fruit of the association of Radha and Krishna, that Sukh, that parrot, has become this Sukadeva Goswami in Parampara. Now, Mukunda, can you give any further evidence? Then, right after making this statement, thus without being damaged, it is endowed with the liquid sweetness of honey, meaning rasa. The parrot, Sukh, has even made the opening in the, fir in the fruit with his beak for the bringing out of that sweetness. So he addresses himself, the parrot sook. You understand? If it is an analogy to an ordinary parrot, you understand? You could simply say, mm, any parrot. But he's identifying this Sukhdev Goswami, the parrot sukha. You understand? He's the one who was first tasted the sweetness of this ras, which is Srimad Bhagavatam. You understand? Then it comes down, that sweetness of that ras has come down in Parampara. And is again being manifest by that sukh in the form of Shukdev Goswami, who's now speaking 
Srimad Bhagavatam to Maharaj Parikshit. And because this is the only parampara in which one can get the nectar of the realizations of the rough inherent in Srimad Bhagavatam, when Baladev Ji was going on hmm, Parikrama around all the holy places and came to Namasharanya, he told that this Romaharshan cannot speak Srimad Bhagavatam. Do you know what is the meaning of Romaharshan? It means the reason Vyasadeva gave him charge of all the Puranas is because when he would speak, he was so intelligent. At the same time, he could speak in such a way that was so sweet. It doesn't mention that it was rusty. It mentions that it was so sweet and so captivating, it would make the hair on your body stand up. Not out of aspasatik vichar, just out of mm, mm, material stimulation. <laughs> you understand? So his name was Roma Harshan. He could call the standing of the hairs on body by the sweetness of the melodies and tunes and uh, the uh, ingenuitive ways in which he spoke Srimad Bhagavatam. His son was now so named Ugrasrava, means he had an intensity to hear. So when Balade removed this professional, this is like Upak in the teeth, this kind of professional recitation of Bhagavatam, he empowered his son, because Baladev is Guru Tattva, he empowered his son with the ability to use Ugrasrava, to use the intensity of his hearing ability to hear this Srimad Bhagavatam from Shukdev Goswami. Then Eitat, one day he returned to Namasaranya, and all the sages recognized, oh, you've heard from your guru, whom even the guru of gurus, Vyas and Nard, put on the Vyasa song. Certainly you should speak to us what you've heard from him. And then this is the genesis of speaking at Namasaranya to the sages there, headed by Sona Karishmi. Understand? And remember, Sutta Goswami also was a small boy. Not small in the sense of when he was first empowered by Baladeva's five, but he was still a young man. And in the midst of all these rishis gathered at Namasharanya, he spoke. Because again they recognize that he's coming in parampara from that Leela Sukh of Srimati Radhika, who is Shukadev Goswami. Therefore he knows. You understand? So I have attempted here to offer praman from several different sources regarding the statements of many high-quality Rasik Babu Vaishnavas who have declared that Shukdev Goswami is in fact with reference mm, to Ananda Vrindavan Champu, Gopal Champu and even Srimad Bhagavatam as Mupaman that he is in fact the Leela Shuk of Srimati Radhika. The opposing party has offered I've only seen minimal opposition in terms of evidence and the evidence is primarily anecdotal. Again, they've not mentioned any Sastra Praman or any mm, commentary Praman for proving that he is not the Leela Shuk of Radhika. Even if you analyze the various narratives, it is fine to understand these various narratives in Puranas as being related to the appearance of Shukdev Goswami. But even Al Srila Prabhupada in the ninth canto has mentioned that in the many narratives, they are not all the speakers of Srimad Bhagavatam. He quotes Baladevi Jabushan saying they're simply appearances of the son of Yas in different kalpas. Now, one other opposing idea that was given was given from one sannyasi, I'm not mentioning by name, a very respected sannyasi. He has since uh, left the world, but um, he spoke that. Uh, in a conversation with Pujapad Shila Bhakti Rakshak Shira Goswami that he heard from him that um, Jagat Guru Shila Prabhupada, our Bhakti San Saraswati Thakur, once in a meeting with a pundit from Assam. Now, a number of things come up here. Pandit can mean many things. He is not mentioned as a Vaishnav scholar, a Vaishnav pundit, just a pundit from Assam in a conversation when he was asked a question by this pundit. Shri Bhakti Sanan Saraswati Thakur gave the more generic answer that Chukdev Goswami's appearance is mentioned in two places in the Puranas and he did not go further than that. Shri 
through Bhakti Raksha Chirigo Swami Maharaj in that assembly, in that snapshot of time and discussion, answered the question in reference to that statement of his own Gurudev. That, yes, it's generally described that this Shukdev Goswami, who was the son of Vyas like this, he's not found to have a position in the higher plane. These are some of the words that they're quoting that he used. Understand? He's not found to have a footing in the higher plane and so forth and so on. But we can understand he's speaking about the appearance of the seminal son of Vyas, Shukdev Goswami. You understand? Because they were trying to rationalize how also Shukdev Goswami could be Brahmavadi. Understand? So he's giving some context in which to digest it. Will we accept that this is the full understanding of Srila Pujapat, Srila uh, Shuddhamara? Absolutely not. I will say this is not the fullness of his expression regarding Shukdev Goswami. And no other evidence has been presented. You understand? So, even I quoted the verse earlier about Nirvikap Samadhi, that is written in Srimad Bhagavatam. But I explained what is Nirvikap Samadhi. And the weight of that one verse, or even other verses indicating the, the nature of the Leela of presenting Brahmavat to show the superiority of breaking Brahmavat is also there in the four Kumaras. It is also other places in Sastra. It's in Bhakti Vinod Thakur's Jaya Dharma with Sanyasi Thakur. So, this is a Sastra theme the supremacy of bhakti and Prem Sevananda over Brahmavad. So this is not an unusual thing. It still does not detract from the many evidences proving that that person who spoke Srimad Bhagavatam was in fact the Krita Shuk, Lila Shuk of Radha and Krishna. So I am begging the causeless mercy of uh, Guru Vagas and especially my Guru Padapadma uh, that they will bless me in this humble attempt to do seva to the conceptions that I heard from his own lotus mouth and many other Rasik high quality Vaishnavas. Hmm? So um, I'll end here and uh, I posted it this way. I had a discussion with one other very nice devotee here and he was suggesting I write it out uh, so that it could be in the Vaishnava Mandal in a written way. But it is better for me, easier for me, when I'm able to speak these conceptions as they're inspired in the flow from my heart uh, by Sri Guru Padma and Guru Parampara and hopefully by the mercy of Sri Shukdev Goswami Ji, right? And um, any replies or answers can also be written in, in the comments or they can be written and addressed on another forum, etc., etc. And I beg that uh, I have many senior God brothers and sisters and also many high class of realized Vaishnavas who in coming across this may be able to, uh, by their mercy, take some time, uh, because most are so busy, absorbed in bhajan, other things, to be very merciful to me and to correct anything that I might have spoken that was incorrect. Right? And again, anything incorrect, that is completely my own uh, ownership, and anything that was absolutely correct and divine is the property of my Guru Parapadma and Guru Parampara. Advancha Kalpa Turuvyascha Kripa Sindhavayavacha Patitanam Pavanebio Vaishnavebio Namo Namaha Jai Radhe Radhe